Welcome to our latest interview um, in a series of interviews that we have from uh, Moore Kingston Smith. My name is Ian Matthews. I'm a partner in our India group and our group is dedicated to working in the UK and India markets. Normally we have a contact or client who works in that market and we ask them questions relevant to their sector and the, the market as a whole. Um, a slight break from that today, we're actually going to interview my two colleagues from uh, Galgoyne, Kishore and Barrett, who are our dedicated team who look predominantly on inward investment, talking with a whole range of Indian businesses about setting up in the UK. The reason for this slight change is that the, the pandemic has changed quite a lot in the last few years. And actually, in the last six months, the UK and Indian governments have announced a fair trade agreement uh, negotiation. And while that is ongoing, things look to be very, very strong between the UK and India, the fifth and sixth largest economies in the world. So this seems like a good time to actually in, uh, have a chat with our team and see what they think, uh, what sort of conversations they're having with Indian businesses and the opportunities that they find. So. Um, you both have over 15 years each uh, experience working with Indian companies looking to, to set up and, and grow in the UK. Um, what are the key cultural differences between these two markets and how have you seen these change over the years? Thanks, Ian, for uh, giving us the introduction and also asking this very uh, key question, which actually has a very thin line difference in it between both the culture differences of India and UK. Of course, India is very dynamic in their uh, uh, country culture, but when it comes to business culture, I would say both countries are almost running on the same engine as India has the you know history of uh, similar law, similar constitution and uh, all legal aspects. So adopting the, in, uh, the UK culture from business point of view becomes much more easier for Indian entrepreneurs and businesses. We have seen, uh, you know, uh, different uh, governments in UK, whether it is, you know, Tories or Labour's or, or uh, any other, you know, kind of a change uh, where most of the governments have accepted that it's a good to do a business with India and they keep on to do that. Moreover, from India point of view, uh, Indian businesses prefer doing business in UK, not only because of the uh, same business culture or uh, English language, but also the proximity to travel to UK and the times on what they share. So it gives them an ease to of doing these kind of businesses. Secondly, what we have seen, uh, Indian, Indian companies at times think that, yes, there could be a difference of currencies because pound is really expensive, close to 100. But yes, all good businesses know that when they invest in UK, uh, they see a lo you know, lot of traction and a lot of similar kind of a growth based on the investment made. So I would say from business point of view, there's a very, very thin line difference, which is hardly there. But both the countries enjoy great relationship and great heritage of doing both inbound and outbound businesses between two continents. You're on mute, Ian. Sorry. Thank, thank you for that, Barrett. Um, that, that was a really interesting uh, response. Uh, thank you. Um, this was probably best to, to throw to you, Kishore. What do Indian businesses uh, that you advise, what do they see as the key opportunities and risks when, when setting up and doing business in the UK? And uh, how are you supporting them navigate these? Let me answer this in the three ways uh, companies would look at uh, entering the UK market. Uh, I think the easiest way and the most convenient way is to look at identifying a, a distributor or a local partner for them to do business in the UK. Uh, that is definitely a, a, a less cost intensive uh, activity. But I believe uh, one of the key areas that the companies need to look at is doing the, the right due diligence to identify these partners who are able to understand your company and, and your vision and also the service and the product offering. So that is something we always suggest our companies to look out for. Uh, the second sort of entry route we see, and, and this is something which we uh, witnessed in the past couple of years uh, happening a lot more, is uh, the MA route. Uh, we have been approached by a number of sort of companies who are looking to uh, acquire businesses in the UK and that we have ready access to the market, the talented workforce or, or complementary product offering to them. Uh, uh, we have seen a few cross-border deals happening in the last couple of years. The challenge here is that uh, the general 
sort of expectation mismatch in the fee structure and the getting the deal done. Indian companies uh, uh, sort of have a, a different way of engaging with advisors in their local market, and that doesn't always uh, match with uh, how they would want to do business in the UK or the expectations of the advisors. Uh, one needs to be aware that the local advisors have the right kind of expertise in dealing with businesses and managing them, and they are able to share that much more valuable insight on any of those deals and the companies, uh, which helps in kind of carrying out the deal forward fairly smoothly. Uh, the last one where a uh, majority of our sort of conversations happen are the, the green field and the new investments that come into the UK. Uh, now the challenges here on both sides, uh, on the UK side, we always suggest that have your immigration advice in place uh, at, on day one, because a lot of advice that we provide on the company structure and the tax work is dependent on the kind of immigration route that one would take uh, to enter the UK, uh, either at, on day one or at a later stage. Uh, it just helps us to kind of structuring things in a better manner. Uh, the other bit is a an, an general understanding that there, the compliances in the UK can be slightly time consuming and there is a process uh, that one needs to follow and rightfully so. For example, uh, every regulated entity in the UK has to carry out an AML check for them to work with you closely, be it your bank or be it professional service firms like us or any, any law firm. One needs to be prepared with those documents on day one. And I think we are so used to in, in India uh, to probably not provide the right set of documents on day one. One needs to kind of uh, ensure that you have the, uh, these documents in place and are able to kind of provide clear copies of these documents when required. Uh, with regard to the challenges that one faces in India, these companies, I think the FEMA regulations uh, put in by the RBI has been a, a big challenge for transfer of that initial set of money to the UK to kind of kickstart their operation. Uh, and the problem is this law is interpreted in a different manner by every uh, bank group. And, and each bank kind of acts as a initial uh, sort of a, uh, an, the authorized dealer to manage the queries from the company side. Uh, because of this interpretation, uh, we have faced a lot of challenge. And even though we have asked businesses to uh, engage with the local uh, Indian chartered accountant uh, to deal with the RVI and the bank, uh, they've always struggled to kind of get the funds transferred on the first instance. So I would suggest that put in some uh, sort of work and, and speak with your bank in advance uh, to understand what route one would need to take to transfer the funds in the UK and, and ensure that your business operations in the UK is not suffering. Thank you for that, Keisha. Um, I understand that that you have a number of com uh, business conversations with uh, clients and contacts um, every day. How have you seen that change? What, what, what are the high growth areas, areas that you're finding at the moment? Right, so with regards to, uh, so in the last two years, it definitely has been fairly challenging in, in engaging with businesses because uh, they've had to kind of look at their India businesses first and, and then look at overseas expansion. Uh, and having said that, our engagement with uh, businesses that are closer to us uh, have definitely been much higher. And, and this is primarily to do with uh, the general tendency of businesses to kind of meet and, and do businesses in person, uh, which has, has been restricted because of the pandemic and travel restrictions. Uh, but having said that, we are slowly seeing the, the restrictions going down and practically gone completely. And, and we have started traveling to uh, other cities uh, in down south and in west. And, and we do see a lot of sort of opportunities coming from uh, that side. Uh, with regards to the sectors or the areas, as you asked, I think uh, in the last couple of years, we've definitely seen uh, companies that have 
had strong sort of client base in the UK and European market to be able to kind of naturally look at the opportunity that UK offers to them. Uh, after that, I think it would be the family run businesses that have looked at, again, uh, they've, they've had a certain amount of growth in the India market and the only natural step is to look at the overseas market and we definitely have seen a lot of uh, promoter driven uh, businesses looking at the UK for new opportunities, access to new technology, or, or just a wider sort of uh, client pool in the UK and Europe and region. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, Barrett, um, everyone knows that India is, is, is a huge subcontinent. So what, what regions around India are you seeing the, the highest growth and uh, for business? And, and do you and uh, Kishore have any plans uh, to, to, to move in country post pandemic? Yes, uh, of course, we know that India is a very diverse country and there are various clusters and pockets which offers different kind of you know, businesses and sectors in general. For example, in India, uh, if you look at the west part state of Gujarat or Maharashtra, these are very famous. Gujarat especially is very famous for uh, you know, manufacturing of uh, chemicals and pharmaceuticals. You move little down to Maharashtra. Again, it's a, being a commercial capital of India, Mumbai. Uh, you see a lot of, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies there, as well as, you know, uh, it's a great hub of automobile and auto ancillaries. Coming down, if you look straight like uh, Karnataka, uh, which is the, you know, Silicon Valley of India in the city called Bangalore. Similarly, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, these three cities are one of the, you know, high promising ITEC, uh, IT and IT enabled services related uh, corridor, which is catering more than 70% of the, uh, you know, outward bound business going to uh, not only in UK, but other parts of the world. Similarly, North remains a mix, uh, you know, cluster, which is daily NCR cluster for uh, whether it is BPO, whether it is manufacturing, a bit of IT, uh, commodities and retail. And similarly, East is also traditionally being a manufacturing cities like Kolkata and now developing, you know, uh, other IT sector. So I would say IT is developing everywhere in these clusters, uh, but India, you know, promises to bring different kind of a, a sectoral growth from India to the uh, UK market. And more importantly, like UK has, you know, uh, Manchester, uh, very famous for textiles uh, predominantly and also for other manufacturing hubs. So there are some uh, connecting dots between Pune and Manchester, or I would say uh, Bangalore to London or even Delhi to Birmingham, those pockets are very well averse and people take direct flight because now UK has diverse airports. So people take direct flights to their you know, different destinations. It's not only going to London, you do business all over, whether it is in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland or any other county of England. So I would see uh, both countries understand very well about the sectors, the offerings, and uh, they have a good uh, you know correlation of working together inbound and outbound thank you very much um, it sounds as if it's very exciting for both countries and there'll be huge opportunities to, uh, for uh, the, the two bit, uh, countries to really grow together and form that strong relationship and it sounds like you two are going to be kept very very busy as i know you have been uh, traveling around only this week i think you've just come back from mumbai so thank you very much for your time um, I look forward to uh, speaking, uh, coming over to India and meeting you in person and a few of the contacts and clients that you've been meeting as well soon. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Ian. We look forward to welcome you here in India and hopefully, you know, encourage more Indian companies to work closely with you. Thank you.